Yes, okay. Um, so the title of the talk is Grounding and Bonding for Home and Mobile HF Stations. And this is an enhancement to the original presentation. We've added some more material um, and uh, got a lot of feedback from various people and experts. And so this is a somewhat expanded talk if you've seen it before. The original talk was presented at Contest University, which was sponsored by ICOM America. So thanks to those organizations. The goals of this session are to understand what ground and bond are. Those words get used a lot. It's uh, really helpful if we agree to uh, mean the same thing when we use them and what do they really mean. Also talk about the different requirements for uh, grounding and bonding as pertains to AC safety, that's power safety, lightning protection, and what do you do with all that pesky RF in the shack? Uh, you're trying to get it uh, radiated off to your friends, not lighten up your station. So we'll talk about that. And in light of all this, um, this is not a cookbook top, but it covers um, a lot of different issues and techniques. So it's kind of a toolbox uh, for your home HF station. You have to look at your own personal circumstances to see what you can do. And we'll discuss the special issues associated with mobile stations. Anybody that's done HF mobile in a car has encountered some interesting uh, phenomena, I'm sure. And we'll approach this from the standpoint of if you do this right once, if you build one common system, you can satisfy all these requirements and you don't have to build three different types of systems. So do it right once and um, you'll save yourself time and money. And then at the end, uh, there's a list of comprehensive resources for the interested reader who wants to uh, pursue this more vigorously. So who is this for? Um, home HF station owners, maybe you're building a new station. That's the perfect time to deal with grounding and bonding because all your stuff's off the table and you haven't got as much stuff as some of us that have been around for a while. So this is the right time to do your grounding and bonding. Maybe you're upgrading a small station. We all start with a few boxes on a desk or a table and um, you got some more boxes and now you're gonna you're gonna put a bigger station together. This is also a good time for grounding and bonding. Maybe you're adding an amplifier. Oh my goodness, you'll learn a lot about grounding and bonding and probably meet the neighbors too. If you live in lightning country, and you guys certainly do, um, lightning protection is always a uh, concern. And when I moved from Seattle, which has hardly any lightning to here in Missouri, which has lots of lightning, but not as much as Florida, um, uh, that became a bigger uh, area of concern for me. And maybe you're just trying for better performance. You want to lower uh, received noise. You want less RF in the shack. You don't want a, that hot spot anymore. It always seems to be at the end of a mic cord, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's who I'm aiming this at. If you're a mobile HF guy, or a gal, and you're installing a new station. Um, we're going to talk about power winding, uh, wiring, equipment bonding, and antenna and feed line issues because you're right in the uh, right in the antenna there. And then dealing with RFIs and noise in vehicles is always exciting. Here's your ham radio references. The ARL handbook, um, any recent edition, has a lot of this material in it. The ARL antenna book has. Uh, the same, the 24th edition um, has the material. There are three free articles, a ham's favorite price, um, on the ARL website, lightning protection for the amateur station in um, July, June, June, July, and August of 2002 QST. Um, they were written by Ron Block in R2B, who was uh, one of the founders of Polyphaser. Very good series of articles. And uh, just search for Ron Block and lightning on the ARL page, you'll find them. There are two really good uh, tutorials by Jim Brown, K9YC. The first one is power grounding, bonding, and audio for amateur radio. And the second one is RFI ferrites and common mode chokes for hams. Both definitely need to be um, on your computer, spend a day reading those things. Jim has a ton of really high quality publications. He's a retired audio engineer. Um, 
and you can find them on his website. If you just Google K9YC and tutorial, you'll go right there. Tom W8JI lives on a uh, hilltop in Georgia with a 300 foot tower. You think he knows about lightning? Yes, he knows about lightning. So he's got a lot of interesting pages about that. And for mobile stations, your go-to source is Alan Applegate, um, K0BG, and his website is strangely enough, K0BG.com. Here's your background reference. This guy, little tiny book. Uh, this is good. Grounding and bonding for the radio amateur. It covers AC wiring and lightning protection and RF management. It was reviewed by a number of really good experts, including Ron Block and Jim Brown and Dale Svetinoff, WA9ENA, um, and uh, a local guy, WB0HSW, um, um, uh, Bill uh, Brown, who's a grounding fellow, and um, the ARL lab got involved too. So um, the reviewers were excellent, and they kept me out of trouble. Uh, they're the ones that really made that book good. And there are numerous examples in the book for you to use. Like I say, it's not a cookbook. Everybody's circumstances are different. But if you understand the principles and the basics, you will uh, be uh, miles ahead. So let's talk about ground. What is ground, anyway? We use that word a lot, but it has different meanings. It can be a noun, meaning a ground like an earth connection. For AC or lightning, that's generally what it means. It can be just a local reference potential, like your circuit ground doesn't necessarily have to be connected to the earth. Or for RF, uh, an RF ground for antennas does um, not necessarily be need to be connected to the earth. Airplanes have grounds, but they don't drag a chain, so I don't think they're connected to the earth. It can be a verb, which means it's an action. You know, I'm going to ground this thing. I'm going to ground this. Uh, wire. I'm going to ground this capacitor. It can be an adjective, which means a type of a thing, such as a ground conductor or a ground system. So you have to be careful. It can mean all these things at the same time. You can have sentences like, I'm grounding the chassis to ground with a ground wire, and they all mean different things. And I've heard people talking to each other, and they are using the word ground, and they're both nodding up and down in the uh, right direction. But after I listened, I realized they were talking about something completely different, but they were using the same word, so they thought they were communicating. So you got to watch out for that. We have to remember that the Earth is not a magic sink into which suddenly we connect a wire to it and a ground rod and all of that RF we don't want and Mr. Lightning and everything else just kind of goes into this ground and the Earth and vanishes. It doesn't do that. Uh, the Earth is uh, got impedance of its own. It's uh, not electrically the same everywhere. The surface is different from the interior, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to remember that the Earth is not just a zero volt, whatever that means, reference. There are also some fuzzy definitions. First of all, we use the term RF ground a lot. Let me tell you, there ain't no such thing. You can sort of create a zero volt uh, point or surface over a frequency range and maybe within certain current and voltage limits. But generally, uh, using the term just gets you into trouble. Don't use it. Um, it's, um, it's kind of a myth. We think that uh, driving a ground rod in and connecting a big wire to it makes everything zero volts. Not true. Ground loops are not the problem you think they are. They can be a problem. Uh, this is typically a thing for audio. Um, where if you, for example, have a ground loop, meaning any continuous path um, connected between pieces of equipment, and it forms a loop and you get a power transformer near it, the magnetic field will induce a voltage in it and you get hum at 60 volts or 50 volts if you live in Canada. And the AC guys uh, talk about ground loops. They don't like it because um, you get neutral currents that flow in a loop and they can be lots of amps that can be a problem so they don't like ground loops um, for that reason so it's really a problem at audio and very low frequencies and you can't get rid of them uh, as we'll see in a bit any ham station has literally dozens of loops and uh, you're not going to get rid of them 
Also, there's this concept of single point ground. That was another uh, concept that came out of the electrical industry. And what it means is by connecting all of your grounds to one point, you um, and not the equipment to each other, um, you won't have any ground loops and they'll all be at the same potential for AC power. Well, all of our equipment is connected to every other piece of, uh, elect, uh, of equipment. So we have many ground loops, but single point is useful if you talk about single point, meaning something electrically small um, so that it doesn't start acting like a transmission line or an antenna. Electrically small at 60 Hertz can be something the size of a football stadium. So uh, the wavelength at 60 Hertz is something like 50 million meters. So something electrically small can still be quite large. But at 20 meters, what is the wavelength at 20 meters? Oh, 20 meters. Uh, the uh, electrically small thing might be six feet or less, couple meters. And as you get higher and higher frequency, electrically small gets smaller and smaller. So something for single point ground has to be electrically small. What is bonding? Um, if you go look up what bonding is, it's, it's, we're bonding right now, yes, we're bonding. But electrically, it's a connection intended to keep two points at the same voltage. That's all it is. It, everything will then go up and down together. That's really important. Um, if they're bonded together electrically, that means they stay at the same voltage. That does good things for you. First of all, it prevents shock hazards from voltage differences. You want all your equipment bonded together. And uh, so if there's a short circuit or insulation failure or something like that, uh, your bonding of the equipment together will keep it all at the same voltage and hopefully some of, some of it's connected to the safety ground. Um, that prevents destructive voltage differences during a lightning surge. When a lightning surge comes along and you're talking about lots of amps or um, lots of, of volts from a nearby strike, you want all of your equipment tied together. If piece of equipment A goes up to a couple thousand volts and equipment B does not, well, you've got a couple thousand volts between this piece and this piece and all that currents going to flow through these cables. That's where you get damage. And um, so by tying everything together, you minimize destructive voltage differences during lightning events. You also want to limit current between your devices caused by RF pickup. So everything uh, is trying to pick up your RF signal. The better, uh, the worse, you, the, the more you want it not to pick up your RF, the better it will act. Uh, we should go out and tell our antennas that absolutely under no circumstances should they pick up RF and then they will work just great. But everything in your station picks up RF just like an antenna. So what you want to do is short that RF voltage out with the bonding. Keep everything at the same voltage. What causes current to flow? Voltage. And what causes RFI? Current. So if you can minimize the voltage differences in your station, you can also minimize the amount of current flowing between pieces of equipment at different voltages and that um, cuts down on RFI. It sounds hard, but it's really not. This is a, a good thing. Uh, you, all that heavy wire that you save from Romex that we can never throw away, that's in a box in the garage, is a perfect application for at number 14 or number 12. It sounds expensive, like you have to use special clamps and materials and welding and all this kind of stuff. Nope. Uh, simple clamps, uh, screw terminals, um, scrap wire, perfectly good. But it does require that when you're doing lightning um, or uh, RF that you use the right piece of scrap material. And we're going to talk about that after a while. Bonding. No matter how you do it, um, as long as it's electrically short and direct and low impedance, it works in your favor for all three of these things that we're trying to accomplish. AC safety, lightning protection, and RF management. Bonding, bonding, bonding. Now for it to work, it has to be low impedance and it has to be short at the frequencies of interest. Electrically small. Anything over a tenth of a wavelength, it starts to look like um, First, it starts to look like an inductor, 
then it starts to look like an open circuit, then it starts to look like a capacitor, and you get all kinds of strange things happening as the uh, conductor gets longer and longer. Keep it short. Um, it has to be heavy enough to carry the expected current. If you're doing bonding, uh, say, out at your tower for uh, lightning protection, that conductor has to be pretty doggone heavy to withstand these kiloamp uh, lightning strikes. Even an indirect surge will have many amps. So you want to use number six or number four or number two or whatever your local building code requires. And it has to be sturdy enough to survive the environment. If you bury uh, a ground radial or ground wire out in the yard um, and you uh, drive over it. I logged off on my phone. So you need to make me co-host again. Okay, somebody's talking on the phone. All right. If you uh, have a, a buried ground conductor and you walk on it or you drive over it or you accidentally dig it up in the rototiller, ask me how I know this. Okay, thank you. Uh, you want, the, um, you want okay, that so conductor to be heavy enough that um, it won't break. You want it to stall the rototiller or hit your shovel hard enough for you to go, what is that? Because if you can cut right through it, it's gone. Your connection is gone, and you may not even know. Plus, you've got frost heaves and all sorts of other things, rocks. So you, you, anything buried or uh, used as a uh, heavy conductor needs to be stout and um, secure. Inside the ham station, what you need to be using is a strap, one and a half inch or larger strap. One, one inch is fine, one and a half or larger uh, 20 gauge strap. It can be copper, it can be aluminum, it can be brass, whatever you've got, or heavy wire number 14 or, or larger. Uh, you can use that flat weave tin braid, the silver stuff, if your equipment moves around uh, mobile stations in particularly. Uh, it, but don't use the exposed braid from old coax. Um, that's not made for that. If you take it out of the jacket, what happens is the, all those little wires that are carefully woven, uh, they start loosening up and they get exposed to oxygen, so they corrode, they get water in them, so they corrode even faster, and uh, it deteriorates quickly. It only works uh, well when it's uh, compressed inside that jacket and protected from the elements by that jacket. If you want to use old coax, just treat it as a big wire. Leave it inside the jacket. Make a big pigtail on each end and put a terminal on it and use it as a big wire. Um, you, so don't take it out of the jacket. AC safety grounding. Let's talk about this. Grounding for AC safety has several names depending on where you live in the country and how old your electrician is. Uh, the current standard is equipment ground, but you will also see it referred to as third wire ground or green wire ground. The ground wires are often covered with green insulation. You want to keep your ground connections for AC safety low resistance. The most important thing about AC safety grounding is low resistance because they have two purposes and two purposes only. The AC safety grounding provides a path back to your AC common point at the, at the service box for fault current. That's short circuits and leakage current. And so you want that conductor to be as heavy as possible so that um, it can carry the same amount of current as the hot and the neutral conductors. And that means uh, it'll carry the, enough current to trip your protective device, whether it's a circuit breaker or a fuse, and remove power from the circuit. These ground connections also stabilize the AC power system. If you go and look at um, the ground wire uh, and you trace it back to your pole, power pole, you'll see the power pole has a ground connection. Um, and so your house is actually connected to the power system grounds. And there's literally thousands of these things. Um, either just a wrap around the bottom of the pole, it's called a butt wrap, a copper wire comes down the pole. Some poles, I think all poles that are installed after a certain date now have to have an actual ground rod, um, or the pole is made out of metal. 
all those ground connections, they might not be very good ground connections, but you have so many of them in parallel that they help stabilize the AC power system during a fault, such as a tree falling on the power lines or, or your neighbor backing into the power pole and knocking the power pole over, or maybe the lightning hits the, the system. So there's only two things that happen with that AC safety ground. It's a path back to your AC system common point and it stabilizes the AC power system. Here's a typical um, uh, power supply for a uh, residence. You have the utility transformer out on the pole and all it is is a center tap transformer, the kind that hams have used uh, for various projects for many years. And so you have two out of phase voltages. These are your two phases that come into your house here, the big black wire. The center tap is neutral, that's the gray wire, and here's the ground connection at your pole, either the butt wrap or the ground rod. If you take off the uh, protective panel and you look at the scary stuff in your service panel, you will see two big buses where, with lots of screws in them where all of the wires come back uh, from your branch circuits. And the white wires go to the neutral bus and the, the bare or green wires go to the ground bus. The ground bus is actually bolted directly to the metal enclosure and the grounding electrode, that's what the name of these things are, whether it's a, a rod or a, a slab ground or whatever, um, that's outside the house or part of the house that's connected to your ground bus. In your main service box, you will also see a jumper between these two and that's called your main bonding jumper. And there should only be one of these in your house. There are special rules for outbuildings and subpanels. We'll get to that in a minute. This is your AC service common point right here. Okay, we are licensed radio amateurs, so we think we know everything. And um, uh, unfortunately, that's not quite true. Uh, I know we can all run branch circuits and some of us are even uh, pretty good electricians. Uh, but if you're not sure what you're doing, please get a how-to reference. I know it's hard to admit that, um, but you know, there's so many weird things that are out there that can be installed in your house now that it's really important uh, to hook them up right. And books like this one, this is the uh, previous edition, it's less than $20. You can get it on Amazon or you can get it um, at the big box stores. There are a number of these how to wire your house books. Uh, get one and follow it. It'll show you how to do all this stuff. Especially follow the rules for subpanels and outbuildings. I was completely unaware of these uh, special cases when I started the book and I thought, hey, Subpanel, what the heck? I put it in, I wired up just like the main panel. I put a ground rod out there. No, you don't do that under certain circumstances. You do not do that. So uh, follow the rules for subpanels and outbuildings. You can create a significant electrocution hazard by not following these rules, and people are killed from this hazard. Um, so uh, do it the way you're supposed to, even if you go. Why do they do that? You can read up on these things and find out. Remember that your local code is the law um, and uh, you're required to do that. Uh, your building code, you can get a copy of your local code. Most of them are uh, uh, based on the National Electrical Code, but there may be special rules in your area uh, because of special soil, because of some other kind of circumstance that um, the, the local code is there to keep your house from burning down. So um, pay attention to that. And uh, your local building department is the authority having jurisdiction. So what they say goes. Lightning protection. Oh, one thing I didn't uh, mention was uh, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, hire a professional electrician to come and do the work. Or sometimes they'll come out and inspect yours and say, that looks great. Or, you know, this over here, don't connect it that way. Let me show you a good way to hook this up. Um, and that can be money in the bank and also uh, prevent fires. Lightning protection. You can't steer lightning. Lightning comes from miles up in the sky. And um, when it gets down to your station, 
you know, uh, another six feet or a foot or 10 feet or even 100 feet really doesn't make a lot of difference to Mr. Lightning. But you can help Mr. Lightning make good decisions. Okay. What does Mr. Lightning want? He wants a heavy, direct path to the earth to get rid of that extra charge, whether the extra charge is coming from above or whether the extra charge is going above from below. The idea is it's got to flow in the earth. And so you want a heavy, direct path to the earth so that Mr. Lightning can do what Mr. Lightning wants without going through your station. Inductance is the most important thing then uh, more important than resistance when you talk about lightning protection. Why? Because lightning protection is very fast transient. And um, the voltage you can create in a conductor uh, from a transient uh, current is proportional to the inductance of the conductor. And it's proportional to the rate of change of current. And the current in a lightning stroke can change in kiloamps per microsecond. That's a lot. So uh, it doesn't take very many nano Henry's of inductance to create substantial voltages, even through straight um, conductors, even straight conductors have uh, inductance, 300 nano Henry's per foot approximately. So if you run a kiloamp uh, per microsecond pulse through even one foot, of number 12 wire, you can have 700 plus volts from one end to the other. So inductance is very important. Your conductors should be short, they should be wide or big, and um, uh, that's the important, important thing for lightning protection. All of these paths that you create in your lightning protection system uh, for your ground system should be outside the residence. Don't make it easy for the lightning to go through your station on the way to the earth. Um, keep Mr. Lightning outside. That's where he wants to be anyway. Outside, you may have several ground electrodes. So here, I'm gonna move my cursor around here. Here's your electrical panel, and it's got a ground rod outside, just like it should. Excellent. Okay, telephone person comes. They install your telephone system. Well, they're required to install a ground system too, so they a ground rod. So they put one in and they hook it up to the to the telephone. Terrific. Then Mr. TV cable guy comes and installs your uh, television or data system or whatever you got. They're required to put in the ground rod, so they put in a ground rod. And then the lady comes to install the. Uh, TV antenna that you bought and runs a ground wire down the outside of your house, just like the NEC requires, and puts in a ground rod. Um, well, that's terrific, but what are these ground rods connected together with outside your house? They're connected with dirt. And what is the resistance of dirt? The resistance of dirt is substantial. If you took a voltmeter and you measured the, the resistance between these, you might measure 10 ohms, you might measure 25 ohms, you might measure 100 ohms. And so what happens when um, a current pulse of 1,000 amps flows in the dirt outside your house and uh, you wind up with, uh, say, uh, 10 ohms, a good, good dirt, and you wind up with 10 ohms between two of these rods. Well, what you get is 10,000 volts between the ground systems of these two uh, devices. And that's when you get these real interesting stories about, I was sitting minding my own business and there was a lightning flash and suddenly a giant green bolt jumped between my telephone and my TV and now nothing in the house works anymore. That's because their ground systems were not tied together and the ground systems went like this and so, that 10,000 volts from this one to this one caused a big arc. And that was a destructive thing. So outside your residence, you create a perimeter ground by bonding all of these ground electrodes together. They must be bonded together. That's a shall for those of you that read contracts or something. The word is shall be bonded together. Typically number six AWG, uh, is what you use and you bond all of your ground rods together. 
And if the ground rods are widely separated, you should put in some extra ones. Um, about every one length of a ground rod typically is the spec. Every 10 feet or so um, will do. And then you just connect them together and you bond them all together. And that perimeter ground system helps keep Mr. Lightning outside your house. Here's an example of what not to do. Here's your tower or any kind of an antenna outside and uh, Mr. Lightning hits it or Mr. Lightning hits a tree nearby or something, something. And suddenly you've got a big current pulse flowing down your tower. And here's your feed lines and it says, okay, I'll flow on them too. And it goes over to your house. Here's your nice uh, entry panel that you connected, uh, constructed, connected to a ground electrode, but it's not bonded to the other ones. Okay. Well, Mr. Lightning is no different than any other current, and it looks at the current pass and it said, well, I've got a good one to ground here, but look at here. I got another one. I can go inside the house through these nice big radios, through the branch circuit, over to the AC service entry, and out to the ground rod over here. So some of me is going to go over here, and that's a good way to wreck radios and other things. So you don't want to give Mr. Lightning a good path through your house. This is the way it's supposed to work. Okay, so here's your AC service entrance. Comes down to your AC service box. Mr. Lightning hits the power system. Here comes the current. Well, some of it goes directly to the ground rod and some of it goes onto these unprotected AC circuits that come out of your, um, come out of your uh, service box. And it flows along, but you've created this wonderful um, single point ground panel, which we're gonna talk about in a minute with a bunch of protectors and all this kind of stuff. And Mr. Lightning says, wow, fantastic. This is a great connection right out to this giant perimeter ground with everything tied together. So most of me is going to go here. Do I want to go to all the trouble of flowing back through the radios and all this kind of stuff? No. So what you created is a low impedance direct path to earth through your perimeter ground system. And that saves the radios and it saves all sorts of other stuff. Okay, what about that tower? Here we're looking down on the tower. You may have seen this part of the drawing before in the handbook and other things. Each leg has a, a nearby ground rod right here and all of the ground rods are tied together with heavy wire that forms a ground ring. That's a great ground system. As the commercial guys have figured out, uh, if you want to really do yourself a favor, as long as the backhoe guy's out there, have him dig a short uh, trench about 30 feet long. Doesn't have to be real deep. We're not talking about a sewer line here. We're just talking about 12 to 18 inches deep and put a big heavy wire, just extend it from the ground wire, you, a ground rod you put in out to the end of the trench, about 30, 30 feet with some ground wires and uh, do that for each one of your ground rods. The wireless uh, telephone guys will tell you that they get a huge amount of mileage out of putting in these radials. It gives a great, heavy, direct, low inductance, low impedance path to the earth. So if Mr. Lightning comes for a visit, he's got a great path. Also, you want to bond your feed lines to the tower every 50 feet. Remember, we talked about uh, rate of change of current times inductance gives you voltage. And even, a, say, a 50-foot tower with a big lightning strike in it can have 100,000 volts just from the inductance from top to bottom. And if your feed lines are not bonded to the tower at the top and bottom, they're not going to be at the same voltage as your tower. And I don't know too many coax jackets that are rated for 100,000 volts. So what happens is you get an arc between the tower through the jacket to the shield of the coax. And so you get pinholes and splits and damage cable and it busts up radios and antennas and things like that. So bond your feed lines to the tower at the top. Maybe you've got um, a feed line bonded to the top because your antenna is directly connected to metal. That's great. 50 feet down or so, you want to put one of these brackets uh, down there or get a grounding kit from uh, Andrews. And yes, you got to put some more connectors on. And yes, it's kind of a pain in the <coughs> neck, uh, but it's worth it to save your antennas, your radios, and your coax. If you've got an insulated base tower, you can use a spark gap, uh, just like a spark plug. I think I've got a picture in here. No. Okay. But you can just take a couple of P 
pieces of heavy wire, cross them over and then separate them a little bit. Um, one millimeter will give you about 3000 volts of uh, arc over. And then once the arc starts, the arc is very low impedance and it will hold the uh, voltage down to about 15 or 20 volts until it is extinguished when the current goes away. Spark gaps for insulated base towers, bonded feed line rods and radials. Here's that single point ground panel that uh, we're talking about. If you go read the lightning literature, you'll encounter this term a lot. Basically, it's a big metal panel. And what you mount on it is all of your protectors. For example, your data or phone line protector, a rotator or control line protector, those lightning arresters that you can buy that have your feed lines coming in and feed lines going out. And you also want to mount your AC power protector on this. It's sometimes called a protected line duplex outlet. In other words, it's a duplex outlet that's got uh, lightning arresters in it and you plug your AC power for your station into that. So this is all mounted together. And the reason you mount them all together is so everything goes up and down together. All of your arresters and protectors should fire at the same time. So you don't have your AC going up and then a few hundred microseconds later, your feed lines come up as the AC is going down. And what you get is big voltage differences if everything doesn't go up and down together. It's like a big floating dock where um, all of the boats are tied to this big floating dock and they go up and down together. So when the guy with the big boat who's not supposed to be generating a weight goes roaring by uh, on party weekend and creates a huge wave, everything goes up and down together and it doesn't tear up the dock and doesn't uh, yank your boat safety line off and all this kind of stuff. Everything goes up and down together. That's from bonding and your arresters all being bonded together on this panel. And this is all tied to your perimeter or lightning ground system. And you also got a big wire going to your station ground bus. This is Grand Central Station for tying everything together. Typically, it can be at an entry panel. If everything comes into your shack uh, through a wall, an exterior wall, the single point ground panel would be where everything comes in. It can also be inside your station. Um, uh, if you wanna run the cables through the uh, a small crawl space or something, you have to be careful. You don't want a lot of lightning energy in your crawl space or basement, but then you can tie everything together in your station. Here's some examples of the things that I was talking about. Here is your uh, protected line duplex outlet. This is what I've got um, in my station. You'll see uh, an example of that in a couple of pictures. Um, it plugs into any old outlet and it gives you a surge protected outlet and you can tie a ground line to any of these screws. These, this is a metal box. This is a protector for a rotator or phone line. And you can see all these little gas discharge tubes here. And there are some transorbs, which are basically heavy duty zeners. And there's some little MOVs, metal oxide barristers that are clamping uh, resistors. These are the antenna uh, lightning protectors that we've known and loved uh, for many years. These are from Polyphaser. Uh, there are two types of these things, be careful. One of them has a capacitor in series with the center conductor. And that is so the impedance of the capacitor makes the um, AC voltage rise faster and causes the gas discharge tube inside these things to fire quicker. And that will help protect your equipment. But the capacitor blocks DC and AC power. If you're feeding a preamp or a remote coax switch or something like that through your antenna protector, make sure you get the right kind. Don't ask me how I learned that. Here's a typical single ground a single point ground panel at a tower base. I have three towers. They're on top of a ridge in central Missouri. I call it the Crawford County Cumulonimbus Discharge Facility because I know it gets hit on a regular basis. So each one of the towers has one of these little electrical boxes down at the bottom. I got some um, inexpensive surplus fiberglass uh, electrical boxes. Inside is a piece of aluminum flashing mounted on plywood. 
And this is an RCS4 L. L means lightning protected. It's got a gas discharge tube, four position um, lightning, uh, a four position coax switch. Here is the hard line that comes in. Each uh, tower has one run of hard line. Here are the antenna outlets. Here's the big ground wire that goes to the ground rod outside the ground connection. And uh, these are um, uh, terminal strips. These are little gas discharge tubes. And the gas discharge tubes are on each one of the uh, rotator control lines. And I'm going to save you a lot of money. Uh, this is irrigation system control wiring. It's way cheaper than the fancy rotator control cable that you can buy that costs many cents per foot. This stuff is cheap. This is 10 conductor number 18 irrigation system control wiring. And it's got 10 conductors, so I doubled up. Uh, you can see two pairs doubled up here. A doubled up pair of number 18 is the same as a number 16, which is the special wire and the rotator control wiring. So I have tail twister rotators. These uh, heavy duty pairs are what run my solenoid and the rest are for the indicator and motor circuits. This is way cheaper, it's direct burial, and uh, all you have to do is deal with the uh, solid wire. Save the uh, expensive stuff for drip loops, rotator loops, running up and down your tower, whatever. Um, save your money. Here's another single point ground panel. This is at the station of K4RO. He also lives on a hilltop um, west of Nashville, and he was losing equipment every time a thunderstorm came through. Something would get blown up. So he finally bit the bullet, and he put this great big metal panel in his garage. His shack is right above this. This is where all the radios and stuff are. So he mounted everything having to do with the antenna system, his filters, his switches, his stack match, his switch boxes, all of that stuff is mounted on this panel. It's all bonded together on this panel. And here's his big ground wire that goes outside to the ground system. Since he installed this, he's lost zero, zero pieces of equipment in several years. So it really made a huge difference. Just bonding everything together uh, keeps it all at the same voltage going up and down together. Here's a single point ground panel in my station. And in my station, I have this big metal rack. People will give these away for free. And I mounted everything um, associated with the antenna uh, system in this rack. You can see the rotator control boxes, uh, two amplifiers, and here's the control boxes for the uh, uh, antenna switches. And here is that isobar uh, protected line duplex outlet. Everything is bonded to the rack. Each one of these operating positions, there's one over here and one over here, is bonded with a big heavy wire, BAW, big ass wire. Um, the BAW runs from this to this and from this to this. This is in back of the um, rack. Here's my power switching right here. I, uh, I'm building a remote access, so I have one of those web-enabled power switches here. They run relays, which control the 220 volts to my amp. And uh, the uh, isobar is plugged into this as well. And then I've got one of those uh, dual line antenna protectors. These are all bonded together. Yeah, I even bond the panels together with this big piece of wire here. You can see a copper wire coming from one operating position here. There's another one right down here. And then this one is the one that goes outside through the wall to my perimeter ground system just a few feet away. It's about a total of about four feet from this rack to the perimeter ground system. Now at uh, uh, 10 meters, that's starting to get a little bit long. Um, and at six meters, it wouldn't be a very good ground, but um, this is what I got. From lightning protection, if you're gonna do lightning protection, Ron Block has created this idea of a protected zone. That sounds good, doesn't it? A protected zone. Read the articles. You create a protected zone by drawing a, a diagram that shows absolutely every piece of equipment that you want to protect. Um, that includes TVs and clocks, anything in this 
room or station or whatever you're trying to protect that's electrical needs to be inside this red box. And then you draw a line signifying all wiring that crosses the boundary of what you consider your protected zone to be. Even little tiny 0.1 amp 120 volt lines for a wall clock. If you do not protect one wire, that is where lightning is going to get in. And if you have an unprotected path into this zone, it can be just as bad as if you had no protected paths. So you gotta be diligent about this, draw the, the box all around everything. And then each one of these lines, you have to figure out what's the right way to protect it. This is why it's not a cookbook talk. Everybody's different. And you've got to bond all this equipment together within the station. So everything goes up and down together. For managing the RF, remember that everything in the station is an antenna. Everything. Uh, that, here's your single point ground panel, um, your tuners, your radios, your power supplies, your PCs, the operator, that means you, um, your mic cable, here's your ground rod, uh, perimeter lightning protection ground system. Every piece of that will act as an antenna. Think about it this way. You've got a 40 meter dipole up in your backyard. What's the wavelength at 40 meters? 40 meters, okay, so that's about 130 something feet. Anything within several wavelengths of that antenna, several times 130 feet, is in the near field of that antenna, and it will pick up energy, lots of it. So you can't say, hey, but my antenna is way out there. It's got nothing to do with what's in my station. Forget about it. Your station is part of your antenna system, and it's exposed to the RF, and it's going to pick up RF. What do you do about it? Okay, so remember, forget about an RF ground. You're not gonna cre create a zero volt RF uh, point at which you can connect everything together and everything's fixed. You want bonding. Everything goes up and down together with electrically short connections, keeps everything at the same voltage. Whatever that is, you don't know. Voltage is always with respect to something else. So uh, it's probably not gonna be zero volts uh, with respect to some arbitrary point, but it will be at the same voltage. Amplifiers, when you light up that 40 meter dipole, you're gonna have high RF field strength in your station, which means a lot of current will be induced on uh, conductors. So you wanna make sure that everything is bonded together. When you put that amplifier on the air, you will find the weak spots in your station that need extra attention. And one of the good ways to deal with this is to create a common reference plane or bus so that it's convenient for you to connect everything to it. You've seen this uh, drawing in one variation or another in the league publications for decades. Um, uh, I, it got improved over the last few iterations of the handbook and this uh, grounding and bonding book. The typical thing is to go down to the hardware store and buy a uh, length of the cheapest possible copper pipe you can find, which is either half an inch copper pipe. Another tip is uh, uh, refrigerator wiring, soft copper wiring, the big stuff. Uh, you can buy a coil of that for pretty cheap. It works just fine. You're not going to be running any water through this stuff. So uh, uh, you can use that as your bonding bus. Use ground clamps. Don't use the hose clamps. The hose clamps are not made for this. And I guarantee you that no matter how tight you tighten them down, they will eventually thermally expand and contract and make sure that they're loose. And uh, when they're loose, so is your connection. So use a ground clamp that's designed for this kind of thing or uh, some other secure, non-flexible uh, connection to your bonding bus. And then you run a big strap over to your single point ground panel. Everything in the station is connected to this even things that don't have power connected to them. You want every bit of exposed metal wired from the enclosed closure to the ground uh, system. Use short or coiled cables, okay? Uh, this is what I was talking about. Uh, you can't get rid of ground loops. How many ground loops are in this station? Literally dozens. Any conducting path through the ground bus and back to the equipment 
that's a ground loop and you can't get rid of it. Um, your coax cables, your uh, shielded RCA phono plugs, all this kind of stuff, um, they create dozens and dozens of ground loops. So how do you fight that? You use short cable, you coil them up, you minimize the area they get ground loop because the amount of voltage induced in that ground loop is proportional to the area. So if you can minimize the area, you can minimize the voltage and the current that are induced in that, that loop. Um, you wanna use shielded cables always. The only thing you can get away without using shielded cable is um, on your DC voltage. But for everything else, control lines, audio especially, data lines, all that kind of stuff, shielded, 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 and use short straps or wire. Keep your cables together as you run them around. You can use one of those cable trays. You can just use Velcro straps. That minimizes the area of these loops. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is one of my operating positions, and I got a Costco table and a poor defenseless Costco table, and then I got some aluminum flashing, cheap at the store, aluminum flashing, and I just took some sheet metal screws and went pew, 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 and just drove them right in there. Don't do this on your grandmother's antique kitchen table. And no, I didn't do that. Um, but uh, if you want to keep domestic tranquility, you might want to pay attention to that. There are, there are shallow head sheet metal screws that work great for this. Uh, you can also hold down the edge. If you find yourself uh, continually getting snagged on the edge, put a roll of double-sided uh, tape, a uh, strip of double-sided tape under the edge of your ground bus. And then when you screw down to it, that'll hold it. That'll hold it down. But you can see all my wires lay right on this. And that means they have high capacity to this uh, common reference point. So do the radios and my filters and all this kind of stuff. Everything sits on this ground plane so that everything is more or less at the same voltage and goes up and down together. In your ground system, remember, all currents flow on all wires. Your AC safety uh, ground current's going to flow on lightning protection wires, on RF management wires. It doesn't come up to a wire and go, oh, I'm a 60 hertz signal. I can't flow on that. That's for lightning. I got to go over here. No, it, all currents flow on all wires. They divide just like any uh, current through some parallel resistance. If you do one single solid ground system, as we've discussed here, made of short, heavy, direct connections, it will satisfy all of the requirements for these three areas. And your perimeter ground system is so necessary, it helps keep lightning outside. If you can't make it go all the way around your residence, then you can uh, go as far as you can, maybe run some radials out into the yard, but make sure that perimeter ground system is outside. Let's talk about the mobile station for a minute. Um, RF issues can be more intense because the RF is more intense. You're right in the, the antenna. You're basically in the antenna ground plane. And you've also got special power wiring considerations. Also vehicle bodies um, have changed over the past 20 years. And the things that we used to be able to assume uh, were connected together Maybe they're not connected together as well as you think now, or if at all. And mounting the antennas is also um, an issue. So mobile power, let's talk about that. Uh, you need to learn about fusing. Uh, that's very important because we're talking about the potential for high current in an automobile uh, vehicle DC uh, power system. If you ever dropped a tool across your battery uh, terminals, you know what I'm talking about. I almost burned up a Volkswagen by not paying attention to this. This is an expensive repair. Ampacity is the, uh, is the rated amount of uh, current that a conductor is uh, rated for without melting <laughs> or melting its in insulation off. I also found out about that. And yes, I found out the hard way. A uh, voltage drop is very important because you've got a lot of current. Instead of 110 volts where you might have a few amps, down at 12 volts, you may have dozens of amps, especially if you uh, have an amplifier or something. So you need to talk about uh, where do you return that power? Uh, we're going to talk about the battery monitoring system. 
RF pickup can really be a problem in mobile power because of these wires running around in the near field of a mobile antenna. And uh, you've also got these new things called DC to DC boosters that are in new cars. And uh, we can also buy them ourselves. They're called battery levelers or uh, battery boosters. So you want fuses in both leads always. That's so if there's a fault and the current, uh, the short circuit current is flowing in the ground lead from your radio back to the battery, you want that fuse in your ground lead so it opens up so that the fault current doesn't roast your uh, power wiring for your radio. Fuses in both leads always. You want to make sure that your power connection is adequately rated. Power sockets, we used to call them cigarette lighters in the vehicles are not sufficient to run a uh, full size 100 watt transceiver. They're typically rated about five to seven amps. Um, unless they specifically say um, maybe 20 amps or 30 amps, and there are very few that do, um, make, don't use the cigarette lighters for your power. Um, power wiring must be adequately sized. The way you figure that out, and this is on the PDF slides, the maximum resistance of your power wiring and that includes the full length of the power from the battery to your radio and back to the battery is equal to the maximum voltage drop you can tolerate divided by the maximum current that your radio is going to draw. Remember that radios need at least 11 volts and usually more or they start uh, doing the monkey dance, uh, the heebie-jeebies and you get all kinds of strange things. So a 12 volt radio really wants to have 13.8 volts. That's the charging voltage of a 12-volt uh, automotive system. Uh, for example, if you can tolerate a half a volt of drop from your battery to your radio, and it draws 25 amps, you can only have 0 0.02 ohms of resistance, and don't forget the connector resistance as well. So you got to run big wires and heavy connectors. Your power return connection should go back to this chassis ground point. And you've got to be very careful because modern vehicles, anything in the last few years, has this thing called a battery monitoring system. And it uses a battery sensor, which mounts on the negative terminal of your battery. This is the negative terminal of a battery. And this is the little sensor. It's a Hall effect sensor. And it tells the computer in your car how many amps are flowing in and out of your battery. And that's how the car can tell if your battery is fully charged or not. If you've got a car that has engine idle shut off, so you pull up a stop sign and instead of sitting there going brum, 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 to impress the ladies, um, the thing, your car shuts off and um, uh, then it starts back up. Well, that puts a lot of starting cycles on your battery. And so the computer monitors all this to make sure your battery is in good shape. Do not connect your radio to the terminal directly because the radio current will bypass this battery sensor and screw up, that's a technical term, screw up the calculation of your battery status. So you want to do what's called home run wiring where everything goes back to this common chassis ground point. You'll, you can find it where your starter motor connects, and follow this battery sensor cable. You go deep down into the bowels of the earth here, you'll find this chassis ground point. That's where you connect your radio's negative lead. Fuses in each lead. If you want to minimize power pick, uh, RF pickup on your power, twist the wires together that come out of your power lead. Um, you can just twist that zip cord together or you can make a heavy, cable of your own by buying some red and black number 10 or number eight and using a power drill to twist them together. That also works really well. And what it does is balance the pickup. It doesn't defeat the pickup. It just makes sure the equal amounts are picked up on both wires so that they, uh, the difference between the wires is zero. Both the wires go up and down together. And if you're gonna put a ferrite core on your power pickup, put it here not back here or anything else. The home run wiring. Okay, vehicles, vehicles have DC to DC boosters and in particularly these engine idle shutoff cars so that your electronics and the computers all run 
during one of these starting cycles when the battery voltage is going to sag. So these are specially designed and they're rated for the automobile loads that the manufacturer knew about. They are not rated to run your radios. So you want to get a ham gear DC to DC booster and connect it to your battery. Do not use the vehicle booster for your ham gear and these will use home run wiring just like the radios. Bonding in mobile stations is very important, uh, but remember the body components in your car are not always well bonded together. They might not even be metal, okay? So you can't assume that uh, just because there's a metal panel in your car or truck that it's gonna be connected back to the battery. If it is, it, it might have a paint uh, splash between the sections or something like that. Don't assume that they're connected together. Don't use subsystem ground points. You may be crawling around under there and you see all these green wires coming together at one point. Don't use that as your uh, radio system ground point. You will upset the systems that assume that point is at zero volts. If you inject a bunch more current, like 20 amps on single sideband voice beats, um, you can upset a computer, which can be a real problem, or uh, maybe your stereo or something else but uh, don't use subsystem ground points as your radio ground point. Bonding to the body, uh, if you tie your DC uh, return to the body of the vehicle, that's gonna create a new and exciting return path for RF. Um, who knows where it's gonna go? You may get lucky and nothing happens, but you may also light up every piece of electronics that's also connected to that body panel. So run your power all the way back to the battery and bonding. You don't have to bond your radio to the vehicle. Radios are made to be just sit in the, in the air, connected to nothing but an antenna and power. So you do not have to bond your transceiver to the vehicle. It may be a good idea for mechanical stability, but it's not required for electrical. What uh, you do want to worry about bonding when you've got more than one piece of equipment. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you want to protect all of your connections for anything in a vehicle with anti-corrosion compound because it's outside, you've got winter salt, you've got thermal cycles, you've got moisture, all these things are bad. Okay, so here's a guy who's got um, um, some kind of transceiver and he's got his control head mounted someplace else. Um, and here's his power wiring. Here's some kind of, what is this thing? Oh, it's his screwdriver antenna controller and all this stuff. He's got it mounted on a nice big aluminum panel. Um, so what he does is he bonds everything together. So it all goes up and down together. Now you've got that bolted to your, um, your vehicle. Well, that body panel is now part of the antenna system. So be careful, watch out, understand what you're doing. Uh, consider mounting all of your stuff together on a sub panel that is not electrically connected to the vehicle, uh, mounted on some kind of uh, high density polyethylene, which is a fancy way of saying uh, cutting board <laughs> or something like that and um, run uh, shoulder nuts, uh, shoulder washers so that when you put the screw through it's not connected not connecting the panel and the bonding panel sub panel directly um, that keeps them electrically isolated and keeps the radio from being connected to something that's part of the antenna another thing is don't bond your control head to the body it's not designed for that um, the manufacturers are not expecting you to do that if you connect your control head ground to a ground that is different than your uh, radio, you can get some real exciting things going on. So it's made to be isolated, let it be isolated. You can mount equipment in these cool little mini racks. Um, that's another good way to do it. You can mount them in truck toolboxes. Those are terrific. Those big metal truck toolboxes are heavy duty and they're shielded as well. Uh, you can get carry case stations like this guy down here. This can cause security issues because if this is not absolutely bolted down in your vehicle, somebody could grab it. But if you move it in and out of your vehicle for mobile operation, that might work. You can bond everything together really well inside one of these. Um, and so that makes it uh, easy to tie everything together. 
And there's really, I'll reiterate this, so strangely enough, you do not have to tie this to your vehicle body. It's, the radios uh, don't expect it, the vehicles don't expect it. Mechanical security is paramount. I know we've all done it. We've bought a little mobile radio. We stuff it down in the seat between us and the transmission hump. And yeah, we'll fix it someday. And then years pass and it's still down there. Um, but if you're ever in an accident, the last thing you want is something that weighs several pounds made out of metal uh, thrashing around in the uh, passenger compartment. People have been killed by stuff hitting them in the head. So at the very least, put it under a seat and tie it down with Velcro straps. If you can secure it with um, something heavier to the seat rails or like that guy had in his truck bolted to the back panel of the cab, do that. Also watch out for airbags. There are airbags everywhere in vehicles now. And you do not want, uh, and no, I did not learn this the hard way. You do not want a radio in front of where an airbag is gonna suddenly explode at 100 miles an hour. Um, it'll push that radio right into you. So uh, ask your dealer if you're not sure where those airbags are and stay good and clear of them. Uh, you can use the channels and doors, pillars, ceilings, all under trim. Uh, typically, it'll come off with some little screws and you'll find that the manufacturers run wiring in there. That's a great place to put your wiring. It's protected and it's shielded additionally from direct RF pickup. Watch out for hidden wiring. When you're drilling a hole into your, into your vehicle, don't let that drill bit go all the way through an inch or two. You may find out where the manufacturers run some expensive to replace uh, hidden wiring. So put a, a little tube of metal over your drill bit so the drill bit can only penetrate the metal, the sheet metal, and maybe another eighth of an inch. And, uh, and then poke around in there very carefully before you start putting in long screws. Uh, you don't wanna uh, short out uh, your 12 volt stuff. Mounting antennas, um, you want to bond to the body at the antenna. If you don't do that, then your coax shield is the return for your antenna. Even if it's sitting right on a metal panel, um, lip mounts may need an additional body bond because the, uh, uh, the paint and the coatings are so good now, those little set screws are made for uh, biting through that and getting to the metal. But uh, there's only four little you know, uh, bits of uh, set screw there. Run a separate uh, bonding wire to a nearby or adjacent um, uh, body screw. Watch out for paint under uh, things because it may look like it's mounted uh, securely and you can use it as uh, body metal, but if it's insulated by paint, no big deal. Mag, mag mounts uh, don't work well at, R, at HF. You get about 130 picofarads, one of those big magnets. That may work okay at VHF, but at HF it doesn't work. Insufficient body coupling. So the RF goes, well, I'm just gonna have to use the feed line shield here. And that's when you can really light up the inside of your car. So it causes RFI and all sorts of things. So put an extra body bond wire at the antenna. The best mount you can get is the Motorola NMO, new Motorola something um, mount. Uh, NMO, it's the big one inch uh, round uh, uh, magnet mount. You drill the hole, it bonds to the body underneath a very secure um, and electrically sturdy connection comes with the coax already connected to it. That's what you want. All the other ones are sort of compromised. And if you got to decouple with ferrites or something, uh, decouple right at the antenna and then again at the radio. Okay, when you're buying a car, look for upfit packages, what they're called. Sometimes they're called fleet radio packages. Um, these are additional packages of equipment you can order with your car uh, for use with a radio. And they'll have special brackets, special wiring, uh, heavy duty alternator. Surprisingly, they're not that expensive because they sell them by the bazillion to uh, police departments and, uh, and sales forces and all that kind of thing. Manufacturer service bulletins uh, are also good. Um, the person you might want to talk to about the upfit packages is not the salesman of the car. Ask to talk to the fleet sales office 
F-L-E-E-T, and they will certainly know about the upfit packages for radios. Manufacturer service bulletins tell you how to mount the radio in the uh, vehicle. Service department guidance, go talk to the service guys. Uh, they've seen it all and uh, they can guide you in the right direction and away from the wrong directions. And car audio shops are surprisingly competent at installing radio equipment in a vehicle and they know where all the secret wiring is. They have all the tools. Um, they have knee pads and the guys are typically young enough that their backs don't hurt and they'll do a good job for you. That's pretty much the talk. I think I've uh, pretty much exhausted everybody's patience here. And are we done yet? Yes, we're pretty much done. The um, PDF uh, slides are available to the club and you can go through and take a look at them. And I guess I can uh, take some questions if somebody wants to read me some chat messages or uh, somebody wants to jump in there and ask a question. So have at it. Not all at once now. <laughs> okay, let's raise some hands or put some questions in the chat there, folks. I, there's a I couple of things in the chat, Dan. John and uh, Z6Q, do you want to unmute and ask your questions or do you want me to read them? I can hear you. Why don't you go ahead and ask your questions, John? Go ahead and ask. I got to unmute. So I had two questions. Um, you in the first part of the presentation about bonding and grounding at the home station, you had said coming inside was bad, and then we had an example of it being in the garage underneath the um, underneath the ham shack. So I was just right. What's what what I'm what I'm referring to is uh, long runs of unprotected cable inside okay. your house, either in the basement or um, in an attic or in a crawl space. The, just minimize the amount of unprotected wiring that goes outside um, in, that's in your house. Give Mr. Lightning the ground system outside your house to the best of your ability. And then I had a second question. I was intrigued by your, your battery connections for the mobile station. And I get the, the main chassis engine ground where the you know where the negative ends up going off of the battery to get down there but i was just curious um it seems a whole lot easier and simpler you know red to positive black to negative right on the battery what it, uh, it, it only do that if you do not have a battery monitoring system if you don't have a battery monitoring system i got a 2008 subi and it does not have a battery monitoring system. If you see one of those little um, battery sensors at mm -hmm. the negative terminal, do not connect to the negative terminal because you'll upset the calculations and eventually you'll drain the battery. Uh, the, the computer will not know about all the current that's being drawn by your radio stuff and it won't run the alternator up to replace it because it didn't know about it. So your battery voltage will will go down and eventually you'll have to replace the battery. Uh, and you may screw up um, the booster operation, any number of other things. There's so many different systems. So do if you've got a battery sense. sensor. Got it. Battery, okay. I'm, I'm on the 2014 and 2015 SUVs, number four and five. I love my SUVs. <laughs> okay. Hey, you might want to lower your screen share. That helps some of the ah, people. Okay. There, how's yeah. that? Hi there. Thank you. There, I can go. There's a couple of okay. other comments in the chat, Dan. Uh, KA7HQP says that knob and tube is very interesting. I guess that's a book or a magazine. And uh, James, K7IDO from Idaho, says Motorola has a great book or article on RF grounding. And that's everything in the chat. So, what, what we just got one more uh, from Pete and to LVI. He says, my antenna is on the opposite end of the house, 60 feet wide from the AC ground rod. I can't run a perimeter ground wire. Is there an alternative through the attic, maybe? Oh, a, a good insurance policy, I think. Uh, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, the uh, I want to go back to the previous question. The Motorola standard that you want to get 
is free. It's available online. Look for R as in Roger 56, R56. Google that and Motorola, and you will find their communications uh, installation standard. Now, you don't have the budget that Motorola does, but you can look at what they recommend and go, well, here's my resources. Here's what I can do that's kind of like that. So um, you want to you wanna look at that. That's the standard. Now, uh, it seems like it's federal law that the shack is always on the other side of the house from the AC ground system. Um, okay, so what you want to do is, um, in, in this case, let's see, and... Um, Okay, uh, well, you're going to need a ground system outside the station, and what you should do is create a single point ground panel at that entrance point to your station. And um, uh, if you can connect it to your AC service entry, fine, but do it outside the house. Maybe you can run a wire along the foundation or something like that. Um, Focus on making an effective, secure, solid, single point ground panel where the antennas come into the house. Um, and that's your best bet. Tie everything together there and connect it to ground system. Okay. Hey, sounds good. We got some hands up. Are you ready to move over there, Barry? Yes. Okay. Larry, you want to pick it up there? I think you had yours up before Oscar. Larry's muted. There he is. There we go. Yeah, I was just worrying about uh, taking a ground wire to a water pipe. That seems to be a pretty common thing in construction. Yeah, the problem, okay, uh, depends on how old your house is. Um, used to be we had all solid copper uh, or galvanized anyway uh, piping that went to the main um, water system. And yes, you could use a cold water pipe as a uh, the ground that's not uh, to code anymore there's so much of that has been replaced with plastic i've seen pictures of um, ground systems that were once all copper and then they did an upgrade to the water system and they cut the copper pipe just outside the house you got about a foot of copper and then it transitions to uh, pvc and all it takes is one pvc coupler in between two sections of copper and you don't have a, a ground system anymore so um, at this point, unless you are absolutely certain that your um, water piping is in fact in contact with the earth for at least eight feet, um, I wouldn't use it. You can tie it in as part of your ground system, but don't depend on it as your AC safety ground. And that's not um, allowed anymore anyway under most code, the NEC. By the way, I didn't show you guys this, this book. This is not the NEC. The NEC is a little thing, and it's just a collection of uh, legalistic, um, you know, definitions and, and rules. It's like a law book. What this is, is the NEC handbook. I think you can see that it says handbook right here. And what this is, is the NEC plus a bunch of rationale and pictures and why do you do it this way and discussion. And so, these things are available for about 30 bucks. I bought one because I was writing the grounding and bonding book. These are available at your library and there are really only two chapters that are of interest to the hams. And one is uh, article, it's called articles in the, in the book. The 200 or 250 that talks about basic AC grounding and outbuildings and things like that. And the other is the 800 sections that are on um, amateur radio, citizens band, external antennas. So this is available at your library. You can go copy the parts that you want anyway. Okay, did, Larry, did that answer your question? Oh yeah, yeah, I was just at... Uh... Okay, thanks Larry. Uh, let's pick up Oscar. Hi Oscar, Warm. long time no see. Well, we, we see each other once in a while, like a, a cycle of I would love to come back years. for the ham fest sometime. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much. Impressive presentation. I like it a lot. My question is, do you have done search or transient measurement, experimental measurements about all these uh, applications of uh, reducing the uh, 
currents and high voltages? Um, the recommendations in the book are based on uh, stuff from companies that have done the, uh, the testing. And that's where my two lightning consultants kept me out of trouble. Uh, that's Ron Block in R2B and Dale Svetnoff, WA9 Echo November Alpha. They're both professional lightning people and they're quite aware of what the uh, current best practices are and all the data uh, that drives them. Um, a little fuse, for example, is a, um, uh, yeah, they make all kinds of things. They fuses, uh, transient suppressors, all that kind of stuff. They have a lot of app notes that um, give the uh, standard transients and uh, a lot of background information. And then there's the IEEE standard lightning transient material that's out of IEEE 1000, which is the, uh, it's called the Green Book. And that is an expensive standard. It may be available in a university library, but that's where the engineering stuff is. Thank you. Data. Yeah, I understand what you what you want. Validated, verified, tested measurements. That's where it is. Okay. That was good. Thank you, Oscar. Anybody else got a question out there? This is a great presentation. Thank I'm you. Hand up, Ken. Who does? Oh, he sure does. Tom, go ahead. Hi, Tom. Hello. Um, some of you said about the ground rig, uh, I'm a retired electrician, 55 years in the craft. Um, something you said about the ground rig struck me. Uh, ground rings, no matter where they're placed, are supposed to be 30 inches down. Um, and that's so that they won't be up on the very dry soil near the top. So when you're running ground rings, they're supposed to be at least 30 inches down to the top of the conductor. Uh, just, just one point. And it, yep. the other is, if your shack is clean at the other end of your house, there is something you can do, but you'll probably need to talk to an electrician about it that makes everything good. And that's called installing a derived system. It's basically an isolation transformer for your AC power to your shack. Now, these are not cheap as dirt. I'm not saying it's a walking off the end of the pier easy thing. But, you know, if, if, you're, if you live in the lightning belt or anything like that, might still be worth considering. You talk to a real electrician and mm -hmm. you're gonna have a one-to-one -one transformer and there'll be no electrical connection between your house's AC system and your shack's AC system. It'll be electromagnetic. There's no wire-to-wire -wire solid metal connection between the two anymore. And you ground that transformer just like you were making a new service. So it, all, it, the grounds, all the grounds are together at your shack to the shack system. Yep, it is a new service. It's it's equivalent to a, a separate power pole transformer. It, it's called it a derived is. system for that reason. Derived system, that's the word I was uh, thinking about. Yes, go talk to your, if you're new construction in particular, go talk to a um, local building inspector or electrical inspector or an electrician and have them tell you what to do before you do it <laughs> and then have to back it out. Um, the, the 30 inch thing is for new construction. And I agree, um, there are a vanishingly small fraction of hams that would actually dig down that far to install it. So I'm trying to give practical advice, but if you're gonna get it inspected, they'll want that 30 inches. And the time to do that is when the house is getting built and before you put the bushes in. Um, anyway, that good good stuff, Tom, thank you. And more importantly, before your significant other puts the flowers in, he or she may not care about those bushes, but those flowers are sacrosanct. Yeah, and, that's right. And the other thing is that when the house is being built, if you're having a house built, you've got two opportunities. They have to waterproof the walls all the way down to the footers. So they got to have the footers exposed. Have them stub up an extra rod at your shack location as well as the one at the service, if they're gonna be apart because you can bond through that concrete encased electrode and it's effectively outside the house and it's a grounding mm -hmm. electrode conductor, even at a grounding electrode rather in and of itself. So a way around it. A concrete encased ground is also known as a UFER, UFER ground. 
Um, and it's used um, in a lot of dry places where a ground rod isn't going to be effective because the soil is sandy or rocky or what have you. Um, and I've asked several experts, Tom, maybe you know, it's a good opportunity for me to ask you, uh, how do the UFA grounds perform at RF? I know that they're effective at lightning and have been extensively tested um, under actual lightning conditions. They work fine and RF, lightning is RF up to about 10 megahertz or so. How, does, how do those ground systems perform as an earth electrode at frequencies above five to 10 megahertz? Well, there's a trick to it. Um, Ufer grounds were, meant, were invented for, by an engineer named Ufer, of course, for ammunition bunkers in the desert Southwest. They were losing, in the middle of a war now, thousands and thousands of pounds of ammunition to lightning strikes. Couldn't afford to have these losses. So an UFA ground is the entire floor of the building. A real UFA ground is not merely a concrete encased electrode need only be 20 feet long and encased in concrete. And that's what the code requires. A real UFA ground is all the steel in the floor, in the footing is double tied with tie wires, you know, and you, you, if you're disciplined at it, you make sure they're tied by two different people uh, that the uh, steel guys don't double tie on the same place because by the second tie you're getting careless, you know, so you have them tied by two different guys and that makes it all one. Okay. And then it's all dependent on the size you're building and how good it is. But a concrete encased electrode per se, only 20 feet, uh-uh, not for RF, just yeah. not enough, you know, area in the earth. Now, if it, if it's a, if it's a wire and they took the time to bond it to each of the pieces of half inch rebar, which is relatively easy to do, different story. But if it's just the bare wire or just one piece of rebar, I wouldn't want to depend on it for an RF ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just a point of order. Concrete itself is surprisingly conductive and um, it's got generally has rebar or reinforcing mesh in it or something. And that's why you never ever want to work on anything energized in your bare feet when you're standing on concrete, like in your garage or your basement or anything else, you don't even really want to have wet shoes because um, you're standing on a live ground is, is what it is. Okay. I, I spent 45 years volunteering in fire and rescue and I ran three electrical injuries, one of them an electrocution for that very cause. Fellow jumped out of his shower, went down looking for an extra pair of shorts touched the shell of the dryer and he was gone. Just and that was because the dryer was miswired, but you know, you yep. can't feel that before you touch it and then it's too late. Yeah, we can't see electricity, unfortunately. Okay, thanks very much, all good stuff. Yes, I would say so, great stuff in fact. Any more questions out there? Comments? Okay. There you go. Looks good All right. Chat. We're good in the chat. Wait a minute. Dennis has got his hand up. Come on, Dennis. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to Ward and uh, really appreciate you coming back and, and joining us for this tonight. Awesome. Uh, great job. We really appreciate what you do. And uh, on behalf of Rat Pack, thank you for uh, coming and joining us. So, okay. Good job. Very good. Thanks. I, you know, I did these uh, hands on radio columns for a long time. And I wrote the one called The Myth of the RF Ground. And that and the next two columns generated more correspondence than anything else in 15 years. And um, so I said to the publications department, I said, you know, we really need to collect this information because it's all over the place. And some of it's in the handbook and some of it's over here and some of it's over there. What is, it, what is a ham to do? You know, electricians focus on power Lightning guys focus on lightning, RF guys focus on RF, but hams have to do all three. So it's been a very well received book and I learned a tremendous amount. If you want to learn about something, write a book about it. Great book about it. That's a great <laughs> book too, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Oh okay, God. gentlemen. Well, oh I got God. some I got uh -huh. some peach cobbler with my name on it downstairs. So I think okay, I'm I might make one quick comment there here, Ward. 
He oh, sure. Help, a couple of times referred to us as a club. We're not a club. This is a group of hams nationwide. Uh, we sent out invitations to them. Uh, they forward to their friends, put to their clubs and so forth. And we have a variety of different amounts of people that show up. Uh, and that's what this is. And then it gets uh, read. Post it gets posted and it's on Facebook as well. I mean YouTube as well. Okay. And so there's a lot of people that see these things. And I really appreciate you showing up for this. This has been a great presentation. Before no we problem. Go, there's one more question. Go ahead. Should we stay out of the shower during a lightning storm? No, I don't think so. It will ask <laughs> Tom how many people he's hauled away from being shocked in the shower. Um, but I, I don't hear much about that. And uh, sorry about that club reference. I give so many talks to clubs that it's just like my neuron is wired to say club. Um, I don't think that's particularly dangerous. But, you know, if you live in a really intense uh, area, ask the guys in Florida <laughs> to see if they stay out of the shower when the, uh, when the lightning's around. Yes. Florida's got it all. Florida and the uh, <laughs> Oscar over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they got it all. They they can it's, they could write books on their experiences. Okay. It's true. Again, we'll stick out there. Any more questions? I looks like uh, people want to run here. No see questions? you guys later. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you everybody okay. Thank for attending. Nice to see you guys. Thanks 73. A lot. Thank you. 73. Seven three. All right, I'm going to pull the plug. As you all know, you can uh, after I shut this thing down, you can just log back in and visit if you want. You're welcome to do so. I leave this this uh, Zoom session open for a while just for that purpose. Seven threes, everyone. Hey, brother, we're at the restaurant, but uh, uh, the funeral will take us.